Yeah, good morning, everybody. Very glad to be here. See you all. Uh, yes, it, of course, it's a beautiful entry, right, to our first day of the workshop. I came in and I saw this beautiful rainbow, expecting a pot of gold at the end, but instead I found magic, right? Um, so yeah, I'm going to give you a short update. Later today, you would get actually uh, more like a show, right, on the website and get some live showing around and, and how magic actually works. And then, of course, tomorrow, right, we have this interactive workshop with quite a few of you where we really start to dive into magic so this is the team it got expanded uh, last year when we got our um, our latest award from nsf a three-year award for a magic facility and we expanded the group by including the irm so you see max jaws and pete on there and we also included uh, uc berkeley with nick swanson heisel and then the old gang you know from the ucsd and oregon state is still in place and that basically uh, makes up the bunch. So today I wanted to quickly go over a few things. We start with, you know, how to get magnetic results right as published magic data sets. So that's actually what this is all about, how to get your magnetics data out there and recognized published. So a few highlights on, on magic. So we began in uh, 2002, so we are more than 20 years old and continuously funded through the NSF. But the first proposal was in around 2002, and we started with a community workshop here at Scripps. And we keep coming back here because it's fun to be here and very productive. Um, MAGIC is a sample-based measurements database. And I just underlined measurements, and I'll come back to that in a minute. And it's driven by the science community to actually use this data repository to answer some really big scientific grant challenges. Um, Restoring standardized diverse data sets. You all know that the data that you collect is rather diverse from paleomagnetics to rock magnetics, geomagnetics, and environmental magnetics. Tremendous number of instrumentation and parameters that you are interested in. But we standardize those parameters and those data so everything becomes homogeneous. Um, and we do that by having one data model that governs everything. And I will show you that in a minute. Uh, when you upload your data in magic, it's versioned, and it's going to be available in an open archive. Um, you can see the URL, earthref.org, magic. So magic actually is part of this umbrella website, earthref.org. And it's an open source a data repository, and, and it's run from GitHub. And you can see the URL there. So if you're interested in the coding and the software behind it, you can go to that GitHub URL and find out. Another thing that's quite important is that after 20 years of working on the magic database, we actually were able to move it in a direction where all the components can be reused for other data repositories. So we basically, we collected all those common components and we put them into what we call the Fiesta API. I'm not going to say what Fiesta stands for, um, but it is you know, akin to magic, right? This is a fun acronym, easy to remember. Uh, but basically that's the engine that now sits underneath magic but we can use that engine for other data repositories as well. And it really allows us to expand all the resources that we build into other important data repositories to the earth sciences. And as I just said, we started our next three year collaboration with this group of universities. So before I actually go on, I wanted to say something about the, the type of database that we have. Well, there's a lot of science databases around, but typically, you know, you can dump or upload, right, just a data file in it, add some metadata to it, and then that's it. And of course, those data repositories are tremendously helpful because we are sharing the data with the larger community. The problem, of course, is that you can upload any kind of data file in any kind of format, with any kind of unit, however the scientist thinks is appropriate for his or her study. And that basically what you end up with is a bunch of files, which is very heterogeneous, because the one Excel file with maybe the same kind of data might actually look quite different from the other file because that might have different units, maybe micro Teslas versus nano Teslas, maybe not using SI units and so forth and so forth. And so it's very hard for the scientists when you download those two data files to, make, to actually work with it. And so we wanted to circumvent that by creating this one data model that basically forces the scientists before they upload their data into magic to translate our data into that data model and into the units that we expect the data to be in. If you do that, all that work beforehand, all your data becomes comparable. And now those two data sets are easily to work with 
when you download them from Magic. Of course, all the work is on the shoulders of the scientists getting the data, right? Your data into the Magic data format now. But what it means that during the long run, over the next five years, 10 years, decades, your data is always in this one data model, and we will transfer it with it as this data model is being modernized. And so your data is always accessible, easily understood, even 20 years from now. So I just wanted to emphasize that because we have this discussion, right? It's important to share data, Sonodo, maybe Pangea, other data archives, very important to have around because the data is available, but that's just the beginning. If you really want to look into the future, you have to make the data set homogeneous, and you can only do that by having a standardized single data model, and Magic has that. Okay, so what is in the Magic database? Just a, a snapshot of what we have in there. More than 4,600 uh, unique publications are in there from 245,000 sites around the world. Nine million measurements are uploaded with it. Three billion raster measurement points from, say, squid analysis, squid yeah, analysis, image analysis. And more importantly, we currently have actively working with uploading data 150 people from around the world. So this is not the total number of contributors. It's just that that's the number of people that are actively working on magic contributions at this moment. And of course, here on the right hand side, you see the interface and a little bit later, you get a show around. So I'm not going to look at that. The workflow is very important to understand too. And we all know this, right? If, if you're doing, doing a mag magic work in your lab, we have different instruments, different software packages, different data reduction, and so forth, and so forth. People save their files in different formats, either Excel or comment limited text files or whatnot. Um, so, so here in the, in the chart, you can see from left to right what a typical workflow is. You acquire your data with different kinds of instrumentation, get a bunch of measurement data files that are in all kinds of formats. Then you go over and you want to interpret the data. Again, you use a whole slew of different software packages. You can see them listed here. There's quite a few more. And out of that, you get the results file. And the results file, again, are stored in various formats in various file types. So it could be Excel files. It could be the magic text file. And the magic text file is basically a text file that adheres to that one data model that magic has. Um, it doesn't matter in this, in our case, you can have both. If you have the Excel file, you can go into the Magic website. You can let, literally upload that file, and I'll show you that in a minute. And actually, the, the whole service will help you translate your Excel, Excel file and translate it into the data model. Um, if you already have a Magic text file, it can, again, you can drag it into the interface to get it uploaded. Or more importantly, you can now use the Fiesta API that powers Magic. And you can actually upload it through the backdoor, but it's basically programmatically with software. So without the interference of a human being, you can actually take that text file and automatically basically pump it into the magic database. And that's very important because that actually allows us to extend, right? And scale up our uploading into magic quite easily. Of course, you have to understand in your lab how that works. And of course, we are providing assistance with that as well, if you want to understand how to automate that step there at the bottom. Um, I'm, this is a very busy slide, but I just want to show you that after 20 years of working with the community and other organizations in cyber infrastructure, we have basically garnered a lot of collaborations. And so we work with different databases of which we are getting the contents into magic. You can see them highlighted there. There's a few that are in desk outlines like the IRM. Hence we have actually the IRM now in our team so we can insert them that um, their database that they collected with a, a tremendous trove of data will make it into magic as well. We really want to work with IDP to get that huge data repository in there as well. And also with Pangea, because we just heard yesterday, a lot of data actually does get uploaded into Pangea, except that it in all kinds of different formats. Um, there's tools that we're working with, um, Excel, PeoMagnetism.org, PeoIntensity.org, PMagPy, you know, there's probably quite a few more. And then on the other side, at the at when we have all the data into Magic, we're working with a lot of organizations that actually can use Magic data in a programmatic way. Um, so there's things like Geocodes, Google Datasets, Datasite, publishers are in there, Wiley, Elsevier, uh, AGU should be there on there too, but it's not. 
nature should be on there. It's it's not on that list. It it goes on and goes on. And that's important because it means when you put your data into magic, we will help you spread out your data set to all those organizations and they know about it too. So people can find it uh, to all those different entities. So one of the thing, right, I showed you early on, we have a tremendous amount of data already into magic. It's maybe still the tip of the iceberg. There's still a lot of data out there that we want you guys to upload into magic, but there's already a lot there. And so, and it's very heterogeneous. There's all kinds of data from rock magnetism to biomagnetism to whatnot. But so we realized it to really help the community to quicker get, get into it, right? And get to the, to the stuff that they need. We are building what we call subdomain views. So we're looking at a subdomain within paleomagnetism or rock magnetism. In this case, the subdomain is on poles. And, you know, to construct a parent polar wonder pods and whatnot, right? Those kind of poles. Um, so this is a subdomain view, which basically allows that group of people to come in and immediately look at the magic database and get to the poles straight away. And this is a, a mock-up uh, design in magic that we're working on now to actually help that community to immediately get to the data to visualize it right here in the polar projection to the right combine the data from multiple data sets together maybe uh, uh, color coded with the age of the of the poll uh, look at normal polls and reverse polls and same thing and you have this very interactive way of looking at the data of the data around polls in magic this is another one that we're working on. That's a subdomain view on rock magnetism. Here, we want to do it differently. We want to look at certain kinds of experiments that you do in rock magnetism. And you can, I don't have a pointer, but you can see that plot types, hysteresis loops, backfield curves, XT curves, FC, ZFC curves, et cetera, et cetera. Typical things that you guys like to work at. And basically, we pre-filter the whole database to collect those particular experiments show them plotted here individually and then on the right hand side we actually aggregate it together in a single plot so again much easier ways to immediately get to the meat of the stuff that you're interested in in this case as a rock magnetist and later on you will get a little bit uh, of a showdown around that so how are we with that huge holding how are we becoming more efficient in the management of magic and all the data in it well, the, the most important thing is, again, I reiterate that it's the data model that we use. We have one data model. We are now in version 3.0. It means that we went from version 0 through 1 to now in 3. So this has been a huge evolution in it. Um, but the thing is, it's all defined. It's, it's the very core of magic. We spend most of our time on defining this data model with the community starting in 2002. So it really developed quite nicely. And it's also quite stable by now. I mean, for the last five years, we have at three point have been at three point oh. We make very very little changes to it. And if we make a change, we only add something to it. We don't delete anything from it. Or we, if there's a description that's not entirely uh, correct, we improve the description of one of the fields in the database. So here's the breakdown of the data model. There's about nine tables. Five of them are the critical ones. They're highlighted in greater location, site, sample specimens, measurements. Each of the tables has groups of fields in it. You can see them for locations. There's a location group, result group, an expedition group, a geology group, etc. And then in each group, there are fields that are broken down, um, described in detail, the kind of units that you need to have for it. Um, if there's validation of that field in the data model, it's also listed here. And it's validation, I mean, making certain that the data you upload actually is correct for that field. And you can see, for example, the H sigma should be a minimum of zero, right? It should be always a positive number or zero if it's, if it's not known. Um, the unit of the H is required, and you can see examples of the unit of the H's that are in here in the, in the data file. On the right-hand side, it's hard to see, but actually you can, you can go into the data model online. It's a beautiful interface. You can collapse all the field, all the tables, all the groups. You can look in detail in every field what's required. You can search it for keywords. There's a lot to it. There's also controlled vocabularies associated with it. And um, so it's a quite a, a complete data set of the 20 years of working with you guys on this. Um, the other thing that's important is version data sets. 
So when you upload a data set, if it's the first time you upload a data set, it's version one. But if you decide later on, oh, I actually have all the measurement data as well, let's upload that too. You can add that to the data set and then you upload it again, it becomes version two. If there's a typo in it, or you need to make a correction, you can make the correction, you upload it again, it becomes version three. All versions are being tracked. You can see here at the bottom, they all retained in the database. So you always can go back to the older versions. And also uh, what's important, every time you actually upload something and you make it public, you publish it in Magic, we give it a data site DOI. So it becomes uniquely uh, identified to that DOI. Of course, the publication DOI is linked to it. And there's a unique landing page for every contribution. That's that, it's called the Magic Contribution Link right on top of there. And in this slide, you can see all the details of what has uploaded, you know, from locations all the way to 35,000 measurements in this particular data set. So uploading, as I said, two ways of doing it. One is by hand in the interface. The other one is programmatically to this Fiesta API. This is the one doing by hand. You simply go into the Magic website, you get to this page, you can literally drag your data file on top of this page, it basically will get uploaded to magic. And then in the second step, it starts to be parse, parse, parsed. Um, basically, it starts to read the file and it starts to compare to the data model and see if it can match it up or not. If it matches up, nothing's wrong. It can simply take it in. If it doesn't recognize it, it will help you getting through the upload and it will you allow, say, this data column in my Excel file is actually this column in the data model. It will train the system. So if you have a similar Excel file later on, you want to upload again, you actually, it has already trained and you can use the training file to do it quicker. So the second time you don't get that warning and it automatically knows how to treat that one column in your Excel file and put it into the data model correctly. When that's all correct and there's no errors anymore, it actually gets uploaded into magic and it becomes part of what's called the private workspace. So it's not, nobody can see it yet, but yourself. This is the private workspace. It's one of the most favorite things I think that people are, like to work with. You can keep uploading any kind of data files in it. And you can, it's basically a way to organize your data. It's still all yourself, you're the only one who can see it, but you can have multiple uploads that you are keeping track of at a time. And you can keep adding data to it until you're satisfied and you actually want to make it public and associated to uh, a peer reviewed publication. What is also important is if you're quite far along and actually you are submitting a paper for review in a journal, you can actually send a link to your private contribution with the submitted paper. So that actually the editors can actually send it around to the reviewers and the reviewers can actually go in here into your private space, see that one particular contribution and actually see all the data that you upload. So actually it allows the reviewers to really see the, what's behind all the plots in your paper and all behind all the summary tables in your table and see the full data set here in magic. One other thing that you need to do is, is before you actually can publish it, you have to validate your data. So there's actually functions in that you can validate whether your data, the data that you uploaded is actually correct against the data model. So again, you can upload a lot, a lot of data in it. You can edit it into the browser. But at some point you want to validate it. And then if it if a field is not correct, say you got a longitude that's 361, right? That's completely, that's of course not correct. It will give you that warning, you can fix that up. And then the next time you validate it, it will actually pass. If all the fields that you uploaded passes, then actually you can actually make it public and publicize it in, uh, in Magic. Okay, FAIR, we all heard a lot about FAIR, right? Which is basically the principles, making a data repository and data in it findable, accessible, interoperable, and reproducible. Um, a lot of the data repositories try to get that distinction. It doesn't mean if people, if data repositories are designed as a FAIR um, enabled database that they really actually do that as we all believe how it should be. Findable and accessible are relatively easily to do. Interoperable and reproducible are two other things. And I think overall in the geosciences or in the sciences, not a lot of the databases are truly interoperable or reproducible. Um, but anyway, let's go through it. More findable. So what do we do in magic? So in magic, every data set that gets 
made public will be described with JSON LD. That's just an acronym you can forget immediately. But basically, it's a structured metadata that's using schema.org that get attached to the data set. And you can see the example here in the middle, just a bunch of codes, but basically provides metadata in a structured way that other entities, other data repositories can actually read on the data set. And those entities are things like EarthCube, Google Dataset Search, EPOS. There's some other ones like that, that the list goes on because it's a standardized way of providing metadata with your data set. Artists can actually you know, go in, digest it, and understand what kind of data actually we are providing. That's what makes it findable beyond our magic uh, interface. Um, and so actually what we do very actively from all in all the data sets, that particular metadata, we go into your data and actually derive from your entire data set, even if it's hundreds of thousands of measurements, the key data that actually describe your data set as a whole. And then it makes it actually quite interesting for Google and other people to um, to index the data set. Um, there's other things like geocodes and data discovery studio that's part of actually um, EarthCube that basically allow, that's actually, those are entities that actually go around all the data repositories that have JSON LD encoding, not just okay. magic, but others as well, aggregate all that information so they can, can combine data from geochemistry databases with magnetics databases, age databases with magnetics databases, and so on. Um, we work together with EPOS. So actually EPOS, that's, and I forgot now the acronym because that's on the other page and I cannot read it. Um, I don't have my reading glasses on, uh, but EPOS is the uh, European Plate Observing System. Yes, I can drive my eyes, so I'm not that bad yet. Um, but anyway, so this is a European organization that does something similar across Europe, tries to get a hold of all the data that's create, that's collected in the geosciences. And we have this agreement between MAGIC and EPOS that actually the EPOS wants to encourage the, the, the scientists in Europe to upload their magnetics data through MAGIC, and then MAGIC will provide it back to EPOS through JSON-LD. So this is how you can see how we work together on this and actually make it simpler for the scientists. There's only one place to upload your data, but then actually we bring it back to other important uh, initiatives like EPOS. And by the same time, you have um, your validate, you know, your work in Europe and all the requirements you have for your awards there. Okay, more accessible. Um, well, when you want to make your data more accessible, you have to recognize, for example, who uploaded the data. So we were the first actually data repository around the world that became a ORCID ID member. So we, we got that because we wanted to use ORC, ORCID IDs, right, to authenticate you when you upload your data which means that if you move from one university to the other, we actually can follow you around. We always know who uh, provided that data set. So this makes it more accessible because we always know who uploaded it. Um, we have data, data DOIs that we mint for every data set. Again, it makes the data set unique and easily findable through DOIs and also makes it easy to reference data in, in papers. Um, and we are, we, as the list goes on, but Magic actually is a recommended nature repository, but we also recommend it to HU, NSF, and other entities. More interoperable and reusable. So that actually is, uh, or, re or reproducible, that's actually a little bit uh, harder to do. Again, we're working with fiscal samples, ideas, and so that's something that started maybe 15 years ago. That's a unique identifier for fiscal samples. Uh, look into that because you guys work on samples. Um, get an IDs and actually associate it with all your data. In the long run, it's going to be very, very important. And those IGS ends are not only for geological samples, they're for biological samples, ice cores, gas samples, et cetera, et cetera. And it's getting a lot of traction around the world. So I think it's one thing to stay. So just get into that. Of course, everybody has ORC IDs. And of course, we'll be publishing uh, our data with DOIs. But another thing too is that Magic actually is licensed like there, which is a very typical way of licensing data repositories under this license agreement. It's a very, it's, it's a very free and open um, way of doing it. So if you're interested in that, you should look up that 
that acronym there and you understand how easily we can share our data uh, with others from the magic data repository. Um, again, I want to re-emphasize, we have this data model, it's very important, it's based on your community input. That also means if you have ideas or new experiments you're developing and you want to add them to magic, contact, you know, the team. So we can, you know, talk to you or with a group of people to understand what this kind of new experimentation is and what kind of parameters we need to store in the magic database so we can expand it and include future experiment types. Um, the Fiesta API is also, it's important to upload your data, right? But it's also very important for other data repositories to find data in magic. So for example, there's another online repository that works around uh, geochemistry data. They can actually, through the Fiesta API, look to the magic data holdings and pull out data, maybe based on the publication DOI, maybe based on the ITSN, maybe based on your org ID. But through that API, we allow for that um, reuse of our data in completely different ways, in this case, in a geochemical uh, community database. And that actually makes it interoperable. Um, of course, we use different kinds of software to help interpret and prepare magic contributions. PMAC Pi is only one of them, but it's important because that's actually, we know that at least 50 or 60 papers per year are being published with the use of PMAC Pi these days. I know there's other software packages there too that have that kind of stuff. So it's, again, it's important to work with the software engineers, right? They're developing those kind of so software packages to make certain they got easy pathways into magic. And again, if you have a software package, you are interested to uh, export magic data, talk to us and we can help you set that up. Um, so the final thing is how do we going to be scaling magic for more data and persisting archiving? So this is a bit of a nerdy, this is the one nerdy thing that we've in there. So you probably, it's all kinds of stuff that's behind magic and Fiesta. That's how we do stuff in the background. The major point is we're using technology that allows to scale up to billions of rows of data very easily. We are now in the tens of millions. We want to go, we can go quite high. So we have that kind of flexibility. We can really take in way more data. So that's good. And then it allows us to do aggregation of data within that huge database. On the right-hand side is another mock-up, something that's pretty close to getting out there. So basically to when we want to filter on ages, instead of giving a, a minimum and a maximum age, which we typically do in data repositories, we can now look at the whole data holdings, provide a histogram of where all the ages are falling. You can move sliders around and basically interactively scale down on the age range you want to get to. Or you say, no, I want to have everything from the Mesozoic. You click on the time scale definitions, the, the latest geological time scale, and you would get there in a heartbeat. These kind of things we're also developing for other parameters. So say paleo intensity, absolute paleo intensity. We could have a similar kind of interface with basically in histogram showing the kinds of paleo intensity ranges you have within the database or if you filter down within the filtered data set. Again, this is another little bit of a nerdy thing. This is basically all the components that power magic through Fiesta. Um, so in the middle, that's it's called this Fiesta container. That's the thing that we can really share is we can clone it literally and use it for something else. Um, with it comes all the interactions we have with in those, in those dash boxes on the, on the perimeters that will come with it. And if you want to build a whole new data repository, you can make a clone of this. And the only thing you have to change is that configuration there on the right hand side, it says config jamel. And you can see what's in there, that's, there's the data model. So basically you can take everything of magic, clone it. And the only thing you have to do is you have to make a, a new data model. And then you basically have an entire new data repository with all the functionality that magic has, but just for something else. And there's four that we have uh, under quite far development at the moment. Actually it's funded through a separate award by NSF. We got one in geochemistry that does petition coefficients. If you don't know where they are, it doesn't matter, but it's for the geochemical community. We are making one on arc and geochronology. We're making, and that of course, that's very applicable to magic. Uh, we're doing one on multi-sensor track data on sediment cores. Anything that you run on an MST, an XRF scanner, a CT scanner over sediment cores, we're building another database with the same technology, with the same API functionality. So you could actually link in magnetics data from magic 
which is CDR data that has line scan images, CT scans, RGB colors, whatever you want to have. And you can actually start combining them in the future. And we also have an online data archive. And some of them, so the top one, based on this cloning, we basically got up and running within a week. Just basically, it's a pretty simple data model, but um, it was pretty pretty easy to do. I can imagine other data, data repositories based on this uh, principle. You could do one on oxygen isotopes and carbon isotopes on sediment cores. Would not be a very complex data model, but it could be one that's focused on that. And you could have a fifth one very easily and work with that community to figure out what should the data model look like. But when that community agrees, you have another data repository that you can start linking in. And with that, that's the end of where I need to be. I don't know if we want to do questions because I'm at my time. Thanks, Anthony, for that overview. Um, I wanted to um, make a positive question about the private workspace and sharing it with reviewers and mm -hmm. collaborators. Um, do we allow, is there an opportunity for people to allow other people to modify their private workspace? And if so, can we prevent that with the reviewers? <laughs> well, I think it's. I mean, from a technical point of view, yes, well, of course, we can do something like that. It's all about permissions, right? That we associate with a particular contribution. Um, however, the question is, what does the community want to do with that, right? So we typically want to do what the community wants to do. If that's something that is actually useful, and I can I can imagine an example where, say, you work on a particular publication with your co-authors, right? Um, that you're preparing and everybody might actually provide different kinds of data set. There might be two labs associated with one publication with different data sets and you want to actually upload from two different labs straight into that contribution. So the question is, is that a common thing that happens or in if that's... And maybe you would give a toggle that said, how are you going? <laughs> I, I mean, as currently implemented, what you do is you provide a URL sort of like a distinct, you know, like when you share a Google feature, someone can use it for you, right? Just sort of nasty long URL. And then when someone clicks on it, it just brings up that private key into the magic search. Um, and so you see it just like you would see a standard um, mm -hmm. so, the, so the implementation is not giving access to your private workspace per se, it's giving access to the reviewer to be able to see the kind of link to the Mm -hmm. so, so I think that's the distinction between the reviews. The reviews would get in like what Nick just described. But if you want to work in a private workspace and allow other people to upload data sets to your private contribution, that's another kind of functionality. And we can't get that. Mm -hmm. no. we, don't have that. we don't have that, but the question is, would that be useful or not? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, thank you. I think we should move on to the next talk.